All aboard! All aboard! Welcome, everyone, to this week's Thought Train. I am one of your conductors, Luciano Gonzalez. And I am Anna Hardy. And we hope that you've bought your ticket. We hope that you've shown it to the good people. And we hope you're ready to go on a thought train with us. So, since this is the first ever thought train, I think it makes a lot of sense for us to introduce ourselves and to give you guys just a little bit of details on who we are. I am Luciano Gonzalez. I am a semi-professional intern at this point. I am a graduate student. I am asexual, and I am a secular humanist. You're going to get to know us really well over the course of the next couple of weeks and the course of the next couple of podcast episodes, so I wanted to keep my introduction short. Well, as I mentioned before, I am Anna. I am a professional student, um, and I mean, that's probably the most interesting thing about me. I'm just excited to be on this thought train, on this journey, through what? I don't know. What are we going to talk about? Well, you see, today's episode is just a little proof of concept, but we are going to go on a very interesting thought train. We're going to talk about sexual education, and I know that's a super fun, not at all controversial topic. So, Anna, why don't you give us a few of your introductory thoughts on this particular stop at our destination? Oh, I love sex education. I think that we need more of it because I grew up in the South, which means that, of course, we learned abstinence and to keep a penny between our knees to be ladies and to keep our virginity until marriage. So honestly, growing up, I didn't really have much of a sex education in terms of like the typical sex ed in schools. It was mainly just like sperm, egg, baby. If you have sex, you're going to have a baby or an STD 100% of the time. So don't do it. Um, but I was kind of lucky enough to have two parents who work in the medical field. And so they definitely brought up sex education in the household. Um, it made it a lot less weird um, and scary than, I guess, most people's parents make it out to seem. But my parents are also very, like, sex positive. Not in the way of, like, go have all the sex you want. But it more in a way of, like, if you're going to have sex, this is how you do it safely. And we're very open to discuss issues, concerns, whatever. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much my general background on sex education. I think we need more of it. Don't think it should be as controversial I, as it is. I'm inclined to agree with that opinion. I strongly believe that we need more sex education. Something that's very interesting to me is that I was raised in Latin America, and some Latin American countries have issues with their education to the point where students are not very likely to make it past middle school. So in order for some of those countries to be able to give their students sex education, they start sex education almost comically early. In Honduras, for a while, there was an introduction to genders that was in, like, kindergarten and in first grade. And it's not sex education by any stretch of the imagination, but it was a thing that was gradually introducing students. And it happened every year with a little bit more detail and stuff. And that's partially because in Honduras, Honduras is suffering an AIDS epidemic. And it's also a country where there's lots of teenagers and lots of young people getting pregnant. So in order for them to start to put a stop to that, they're starting to invest more in sex education. And I had very bad sex education growing up, not for any one particular person's fault, but because when I was in middle school, which is where a lot of students in the United States start receiving their sex education, even if it's abstinence-only sex education, with the penny between the knees and all of that, um, I did not get that because I went to a very conservative Christian school in North Carolina for sixth and seventh grade. And then when I was in the eighth grade, I went to a public school. But at that point, the sex education was already stuff that was beyond me because I didn't have the basis that students normally build when they're in the sixth and seventh grade. It was to the point where when my mom asked me once, she was trying to check up on me and see how much I knew. I was in the 10th grade and she's like, hey, Josh, which is my middle name. And that's what my mom and dad usually call me. 
do you know how a baby is made? And I look at her with complete sincerity. And I'm just like, well, you see, mom, a boy has a penis. And with that penis, he sticks it in a girl's butt. And she looked at me and says, no, that is, that is not how that happens. I am deeply concerned. And you see, <laughs> if I had been a straight boy, that would have been an issue. Fortunately, I am asexual. So I, th that ended up being an issue, but it ended up being a purely theoretical issue. It wasn't, it wasn't an issue, especially because when I moved to Honduras, I got more sex education. So loose. I have a query. Go on. Okay, so if I'm if I'm supposedly going to buy into this idea that if you stick a penis in a woman's butt, how do you explain her getting pregnant? And where does the baby come out? Does she, does she just poop it out? Because that's just I don't know which one's worse. Imagining pushing a baby from a vagina or pushing a baby from your butt. So for the record, I understood, at least in theory, the idea that there was a there was a an appendage from which pee came out, and that is not the same thing as the vagina. But I understood. You're, you're talking that about a woman, though. For, they have a, yes. Okay. Yes, I understood that, but I did not put two and two together because. I'm going to tell you a secret. Are you are you ready? I'm so ready. <laughs> I was very dumb. <laughs> and anything has changed? I, <laughs> no, but you see now I'm a dummy in graduate school. So, I <laughs> basically I'm an degree. older dummy. <laughs> basically I'm older and I'm still a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, yeah, so the the basic point of this is the idea that we need more sex education is absolutely true. Also, at some point, we should probably start regulating private schools and demanding that they also have sex education. Because it's not a thing that we currently do. And it's kind of a problem because there are a lot of really smart people in private schools. Unfortunately, there's a, a lot of dum-dums in private schools, too. I would know I was one of them. So I was thinking about the misconceptions that, like, growing up I had about sex in general versus, like, what I know now. And I am not going to lie, until I was probably 21 out of my 22 years of life, I thought that STDs were incurable. Like, and I don't mean just, like, HIV, syphilis. I meant, like, everyone like gonorrhea, chlamydia, all of those. And I don't know why. Actually, I do know why. Because I was pretty much taught, I remember being in a middle school classroom and my stereotypically butch lesbian teacher was explaining how when you have sex, you have a chance, a quote unquote chance, which means a hundred percent chance of contracting an STD, STI, or getting pregnant, and she showed us these horrible pictures of specifically gonorrhea, I remember, and she was like, do you want this? And I was like, no, I don't want this. <laughs> and she's like, you're gonna get this if you have sex. But she didn't tell us that you can also take an antibiotic for it. <laughs> so up until I was 21 and I was talking to my mother about something and I had brought up, like, STDs for some reason, because, you know, that's how my family rolls. Um, she informed me with a very confused face that a good bit of STDs and STIs you can treat with, with antibiotics. <laughs> I thought they were just, like, I know, I God diseases. <laughs> I know that you're, like, really humiliated, but I hope that you feel a little bit of comfort in knowing that this story is going to come after the story I told. So oh, no, I, don't, that, that I mean, I'm embarrassed, about, I'm embarrassed about it, but I'm definitely not as embarrassed as I would be if I thought that a guy sticking it up my butt would make me pregnant. 
which technically can happen because if the semen travels to the vaginal mm-hmm. opening, it has a chance of, you know, swimming its way up like a Michael Phelps sperm. <laughs> the next, the, the true Olympics right there. <laughs> sperm sports. <laughs> Good lord. Any other this funny any misconceptions? Podcast. Any oh, other funny misconceptions? Because I can huh. think of many more. <laughs> I can I can think of more than a few, but something that I wanted to talk about because we we mentioned this in a previous conversation that we had. Um, we why don't we talk a little bit about the the old wedding day special that we joked about? Because oh, God. Can, so why don't you tell me a little bit since you actually had sex uh, sexual education of some sort? Why don't you tell me a little bit about some of the ways that they tried to sort of scare you? into, you know, not having sex. Ooh. Well, besides growing up in, like, the fucking Bible Belt, that was pretty scary, but, um, because apparently Jesus don't like sex. He was not a fun guy. Um, but I guess the funniest one that I can think of is also in middle school. I don't know what was up with sex ed in middle school, um, but... My teacher laid a blanket down in the middle of the in the of the classroom and picked two students and he was like, Okay, you guys are gonna get married. And they were like, Cool. And he went, except girl example has had sex with this person and this person and this person. And then all three of those people had to come and sit on the blanket. And then he was like, and the guy has also had sex with these four people, and so they had to sit on the blanket. And he was like, and then this sexual partner of the girl had also had sex with X amount of other people. And eventually the entire class was sitting on the blanket, because apparently if you have sex before marriage on your wedding night, everybody you have ever had sex with and who they've ever had sex with shows up magically in your bed as you consummate this marriage. Because if you have sex with one, you have sex with all. It's really weird that over in Georgia's sexual education in, like, the early 2000s, they thought that everyone was basically having a wedding night special. But that's (laughs) that's beside the point. A story that I actually heard. (laughs) The best kind. The best kind of orgy. So another story that I heard, and this is something that I actually have friends in North Carolina who they had to go through this, is the idea of the chewed up gum, which is actually also the exact same sort of rhetoric that some conservative Muslims on YouTube use to describe having more than one sexual partner and to describe having premarital sex. And basically this idea is that a woman is a piece of gum and she wants to be nice and pristine for her husband so that way when they get married he can chew her all up but you see if a woman has sex for some reason they never apply this to the guys too i've never heard an instance where like they're having a conversation with males and they're like yeah you're a piece of gum how does it feel fucking double standards (laughs) <laughs> but <laughs> what they what they tell the women what they tell the little girls is that like hey for every sexual partner you have um it's basically someone putting you in their mouth once chewing you just a little bit and then giving you to someone else and that's your next sexual partner on and on up until you get to your husband and your husband is just going to have this really nasty used piece of gum. And you don't want to be a nasty used piece of gum, do you? That's really, that's so fucked up. First off, I thought you were like, I was in my brain when you were saying that these girls are getting chewed up, pieces being pieces of gum. I was like, is this an ad for cannibalism? But also, (laughs) why does it end with the husband? Like, I mean, you can get married, but you can also get divorced. You can be in a polygamous relationship. You can have an open relationship. Why is why is your husband the last person you go and fuck? Like, why is it assumed? I know why it's assumed, but... Free will, man. Free will. Are you telling me that there are women out there who are gonna get married and then have sex with other people? 
the horror. Oh my god, women having sex in general. Women don't like sex. What are you talking about? We don't crave it. We don't it's not in our natural instinct until you put a ring on it because then all of a sudden the fucking floodgates of the vagina open and the heavens descend. Yeah. I see I see that you finally got a job as a health teacher in Georgia. <laughs> no, if I had to teach my kids sex ed, I don't know. I don't know if they would want me. Their parents would be calling and being like, "Why? Why?" Are you teaching so my are, kids? Are you <laughs> Are you telling me that you would like get a banana and you'd be like, "Hey kids, this is a penis. Here's a condom. Boom. Safe sex." Yeah, that's the kind of that's the kind of teacher I would be. My mother, it was later in life that my mother became more open about talking uh about sex in general. Um because she also grew up in a very southern home and you you didn't have sex and you didn't talk about it and yeah that that also ended up with her being a you know teenage mother so sex ed is important guys because guess what you could have a baby but you can also prevent it and have fun what sex is fun what no it's only That's fun for the guys wild. only fun for the guys That's why guys don't need to know where the clitoris is or where to find it lord so anna tell me what's something that you would like to see at the very least discussed more in sex ed Ooh, that's a good one um <laughs> i don't know i guess my main problem with the sex education system here especially like in georgia um and and, and i'm assuming the south in general because we're the bible belt but like stop talking about religion in terms of sex because it should not be like religion can define a person's morals but you shouldn't be like don't have sex or god's not gonna love you like what the, what the fuck people have like legit done that in sex ed classes where they're like jesus is gonna be watching you jesus knows where you put your dick like that drives me up a wall but I'm also just very, very sensitive to being told what to do in general, <laughs> what I can and can't do. Um, but let's see. Anything else? I th I think more general awareness on, like, how to prevent yourself from getting hurt. So are you telling me that we should get Jesus out of the classroom and the bedroom? Yes. <laughs> Jesus should not be where I'm learning or in my pants. I just, that's, I'm, it's not my kink. I'm not down with that. Me and so, my bisexual ass would want a lot of other things except Jesus in my bed. So if you're asking me what it is that I think there should be a greater emphasis on, it should be the concept. Am. It should be the concept, I'm going to ignore the rudeness, it should be the concept <laughs> of enthusiastic consent. Because there's a very heavy oh, emphasis yeah. on how to say no, which is extremely important. This isn't me, this isn't me trying to undermine that in any way. But the reality is, if there's so much time showing students what it's like to say no, and what that feels like, there are going to be people who are less certain in their ability to make it clear that they're saying yes which is also a problem. I would argue that it's probably not as serious as a problem as someone's inability to say no, but it's something that needs to be addressed because the reality is young people are sexual. Many of them are, unless they're like me and they're ace, and they need to know, like, boundaries need to be set. And also, part of setting boundaries is establishing what is acceptable. Well said. I agree 100%. I remember um I remember being in a class because obviously I've went to a lot of sex classes. Um I remember being in a class and this male teacher was trying to explain to us females, specifically females, um how to say no to sex. And he was like, "You can't just like whisper no. You can't just be like, no." 
and like say it all like playfully and all of this stuff you have to like yell it or they're not gonna listen and I, and that that message in itself that women need to be aggressive to have a man listen to her about whether or not he can have sex with her is something I have a huge problem with. Also, the fact that he specifically was talking to females because men should have the same should have the same like emphasis on whether or not they want to have sex. Like quality man. I think that that's a really important point. The the because especially because like there's there's a lot of assumptions that are made in male sex ed classes. One of the issues is that like they're segregated in the first place and someone can make some like reasonable people could make a case that like there are certain things that it's just like yeah, you can teach these things to both genders and you can teach them to them together or separately. But the reality is there probably should be more like desegregated in terms of gender sex ed classes especially because then that way both genders know they're teaching the same thing and both genders are being taught the same thing because it's really weird that like there are separate classes for both genders that was what happened to me in north carolina when i was in the eighth grade um my sex ed class there were some classes because it was a like a multi-day thing but there were some classes where it was all guys and then there were some classes where it was mixed and obviously that means there were some classes where it was all girls but i was in the guys class and to this day i still don't know <laughs> what it is the girls class was being taught i'm assuming they were being taught like the they were being taught like what the uterus looks like in its anatomy because that like that equivalent was what the guys were being taught we were being taught like about the testicles and about like the composition i guess of the penis the anatomy of the penis yeah, I remember I remember the split classes and we definitely like at least in my experience when we were split um a woman came in and would talk to us about like, you know, what to expect when your period comes and like what your uterus is and what it's meant for, which is apparently baby making. And that's the only thing your vagina is good for. Um and like what kind of happens? They never really like explained explicitly what happens with a period i had to have like my mother explain it to me um and to this day i could not explain to you most of the male anatomy like i know that there's a penis and then there's testicles that's about all i got i don't i don't know i am quite ignorant when it comes to male anatomy as i assume most males are towards female anatomy <laughs> At the very least, in my case, that would be an accurate assumption. I'm not going to speak for other men, <laughs> because I, I have no doubt there are plenty of men out there who are just like, yeah, I could look at this picture or, or this crude drawing of a uterus, and I could clearly identify all the parts. But if you gave that to me, I would be very confused. So, <laughs> don't. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your test, Luciano. <laughs> Sorry, kids, we're being quizzed. Before before we can go on a date you have to answer this question and draw a uterus i could draw a uterus but the reason i could draw it, it wouldn't be a good drawing the reason i could draw it is that there's a meme that people have circulated in some cases jokingly but in other cases not so jokingly where like the uterus is like a picture of a uterus and it's also a picture of like a goat's head and it's like the like little ram's horns. I'm gonna see if I can find I mean, it and share it with you. But I'll also see if I can attach it in like the description of the actual podcast when it comes out. But it's just like, yeah, you see, women are the devil, and obviously it's sexist. But like people, most people have used it as a joke, not like seriously. I mean, I would I, I would argue that our uteruses are the devil. Because fuck them, but yeah, that's that's kind of sexist. <laughs> Lots of memes are <laughs> meme memes are problematic, and we should practice call out culture on memes when they are dangerous. And that's not to say that like that's not to say that just because something was dangerous in its original way doesn't mean it's still dangerous now. Because that's that's a conversation that people should probably have. But like. 
Yeah, lots of memes had really bad origins, and people should know the origins of, like, the materials they're sharing. Even if it's like, oh yeah, this is a joke now, it's probably still best for people to know where that thing came from. So, since we're talking about sex, do you want to talk about sexuality? Yeah, let's talk sexuality. what we are? Yeah, so what are you? What, What are you, Anna? Um, well... I am a cis white woman who <laughs> is also an extreme bisexual. Man, do I love the titties. <laughs> but um yeah, so obviously if you haven't caught on, we are dating. Um this is my boyfriend Luciano, also known as Luciano. I don't pronounce it that way. Um You're- I am bisexual. I just want to repeat that I'm bisexual, just, like, so the world knows. <laughs> there, There is no anyway, doubt as to Anna's sexuality. Um, my sexuality <laughs> is non-existent. I am ace, which which is a funny, because I spent a very long time not knowing I was ace. It took me a while to realize that, and that was very painful. Um, there are a lot of asexual people, especially in sex in sex-negative cultures, like, the United States is kind of a sex negative culture, which means that like it's a culture where the society is generally repressive and has hostile attitudes towards sexuality. And there are people so assessments of the United States is like sex negativity or sex positivity are mixed. But I was raised in the United States and in Latin America. And everyone just sort of assumes that you have a sexuality in those in those countries. And to be fair, that's the case in most places. The problem is that, like, if you don't demonstrate any particular sexuality one way or another, people just sort of say that you're a late bloomer, or the most common rhetoric that I've heard is that you just haven't met the right person. Um, so I'm, I'm yeah. going to talk a little bit about what I am specifically, because asexuality actually exists on a bit of a spectrum. I am someone who is demisexual, which means that I am sort of a gray asexual person, as in I am capable of experiencing sexual attraction. I am demisexual, which means that I, if I am close to someone emotionally, I can start to experience a sexual attraction to them. And that is something that's happened to me before. Um, I'm not going to dive super into that in this particular episode, but yeah, that's that's my sexuality. Well, my sexuality went through various forms until I, I came to the conclusion that, you know, I like everybody. <laughs> um, I went through a really strong phase of thinking that I was a lesbian, like hardcore. Like it was everyone knew it. <laughs> I had to talk about it to everybody. And that that happened uh that fixation um went on for for quite some time and I dated mainly females and then uh towards my college years I was like you know what maybe I'm just being a dick to the guys because man they are some fine mamma jammas um and then it just became like a clusterfuck of I'm dating a guy I'm dating a girl I don't really care what their genitalia is I like their personality and I like both their genitalia so it's fine And that's where I'm at now. I like the dicks and the pussies. It's fun. That's super exciting. (laughs) (laughs) Sexuality. Sexuality is actually a really interesting topic, especially because as someone who is an asexual, I've gotten to see and personally experience a whole bunch of different attitudes towards sex and sexuality. And like, it was not an easy experience for me. This isn't going to be our sexuality episode. We're going to we're going to have a deeper dive into that oh, no. in a future one, but I I am happy to be sharing these sorts of things with people who are going to listen into us and get to know just a little bit about us because after all, like the purpose of the thought train is to have really neat conversations about a range of different topics in fun and innovative ways, and I think that podcasting is really great for that. And also, I think that our personalities mesh so well and that we have really fun conversations about a whole bunch of different things privately that I just wanted to share the sorts of stuff that we talk about with other people. I think that that's a solid amount for the first episode. Um, I hope that people are having fun with us and getting to know us a little bit better. 
we are interested in hearing what other people would like to talk about with us and to hear us talk about. And those are my closing remarks. Can my co-train conductor help me close out today's episode? <laughs> All aboard, y'all. <laughs> All aboard. Now that the train is at its destination. That's what you do when a train arrives. <laughs> no, get the fuck off my train. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, no, this has been a great, great experience. I'm really excited to see where this goes. Um, yeah, let us know what you want us to talk about. And, uh, I'm sure we're probably going to have some similar opinions, but <laughs> as <laughs> Luciano has found out, I am very opinionated <laughs> about many subjects, most of which are different than his. So, uh, let us know what you want to talk about and you'll hear, hear us with the choo-choos. And yeah, outros. <laughs> <laughs>